You're listening to the All In Podcast with your hosts, Shane and Blake, giving you a new perspective on the dental industry. Are you ready to go all in? Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. Welcome to the All In Podcast, the podcast that brings you a new perspective on the dental industry. I am Shane McElroy, and as always, joined by my friend, Blake McClellan. How are you, Blake? Howdy. Feeling good. Feeling great. It's almost five o'clock and uh, you know what? Oh, it's only 3.30. So, well, close enough. Don't trouble that. I'm going to get in trouble now. <laughs> Were you really? No. Oh. <laughs> Nobody listens to this anyway, so we'll be fine. That's true. <laughs> well, at least hopefully no one at bio. Sorry, guys. He, he was doing some uh, overtime hours this morning. That's what it was. I was busting my ass at 6 a.m. I had a full arch case, so we're good to go, man. Plus, a new customer today, so nobody's going to say a word. Look at that. Well, and to be fair, you did hook him up with uh, a white paper study and a live surgery uh, for free. So I think, you, I think you're doing pretty good as an employee there. Just taking advantage of my friends. Absolutely. That was pretty fun, though. You know, I love that guy, Stuart, uh, mainly because I'm Irish, so... You know, if you're Irish, you're automatically getting a nine points in my book. But, you know, he's really got a neat perspective on how he looks at things. His dad was a, or is a dentist and, and an educator. And so he's kind of got a unique insight, but he's on the business side. So it's kind of this, you know, hybrid approach, which I think is beneficial for, for bio. He's really going to do some cool things there. Yeah. So Stuart Nicholson is our senior director of implant marketing, and he actually has sales experience on the implant side. And I think that helps him a lot marketing. He, he really is just a really cool guy. And Blake's referencing, we did an implant compare live stream surgery a couple of days ago with Dr. Paul Anderson showing off an immediate molar case. It was a really good one too. I, that was the most fun I've had doing one so far. It's easy for me because that shit is stressful and I don't have to deal with any of it other than setting it up the actual case. You got all the stressful part. You know, it's kind of my drug. I tell David all the time afterwards, like, I love it because just like when a clinician needs you in a surgery, like when you're really in it, it's like, especially like for KLS reps or um, doing trauma and plates and stuff, but, or, you know, full arch like you, you know, when you're needed like that in the OR and a lot of it's dependent, the success of that day is on your shoulders. It's a lot of pressure. And I love that part of it. I, I mean, uh, if I could go back, I would probably go the surgery path because it's. I, I think that adrenaline is is the reward right there. Those days are not easy. They're not easy at all. The internet can go wrong, lighting, cameras. You're having to work around a surgeon and not disrupt their flow while also dealing with technology, which is always problematic. It's just, you know, it is a nightmare, but it's also, and we hate it in the moment, but after it's all said and done, it's like, oh. You breathe and you're like, oh, that was awesome. We pulled it off. Hoorah. Yeah. And you never know who's going to be good while doing a surgery and speaking and trying to treat it as, you know, pay attention to the patient. And I hate giving credit to my buddy, Paul Anderson. He's an oral surgeon down here. He did a really, really good job. No, he did. And he's really poised. And you see that on live because, you know, he asked me like a bunch of questions beforehand. What do you need me to do? How should I act? I said, listen, I tell everybody the same thing. Do you, do you, and let us work around you. Your job is to do that case. Our job is to document it. So I often tell them, just teach it as you're being shadowed that day and explain it as you're being shadowed. That's the best way to teach it. Don't present to an audience. Don't think about an audience. And I think that's also the difference why we get the people we do on the platform, because they're usually not people who would go on the podium. And that's not for everybody. But I mean, a lot of the people that work with us are somebody that doesn't really have the ambition or there's no draw for them to the stage, but for them, they love teaching. And with doing it, you know, this way, well, like we do with implant compare, it's, it's just, it's easy. So it's, no, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was a good case. It's, it was cool for us because now we're going to be a part of a, you know, a study and, you know, to see that kind of unique case. I mean, that was a, that tooth, man, that was an, it looked like it was going to be a nightmare. Yeah. I thought it was just going to shatter and he was able to get it out all in one piece and converging roots. And it was, it was pretty interesting. I hadn't seen a an extraction done with a, a tooth that bad a shape before that didn't fracture in half. It was pretty good, man. He did well. He did well. He's going to hear this and his ego is going to get real big. Old. <laughs> now we need him for some zygos and some pterygoids, huh? Well, that's what you got to see next. All, all, all in, all in. Step up your game, Anderson. No, you know, and, and that kind of is a good segue for us 
because you know we were talking about earlier in the week and and today about KOLs and honorariums. It's come up a lot uh, with how that how that works and what to do, especially with people on Instagram or Facebook or doing courses that maybe not on the big stage at the main conferences um, because they're maybe not sponsored or they're not working with a brand already or whatever it may be, but that they're really good lectures or good teachers. Like, how do you, how do, what do I do? How do I become a KOL? And what is a KOL? And what does that actually mean? You know, a lot of people don't even know what the, main, the word means or the acronym means. It's key opinion leader. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people who want to get out there and lecture, but don't know where to start. They don't know what to ask for. And I'm actually working with a couple of young guys, kind of giving them the pathway, how to do this, how to make money doing it. But it's not the same as it used to be. It used to be you had to be out there for 20 years and have studies and all this other stuff behind you. And you had to have a company pay you a ton of money and they controlled all the courses and everything. And that has completely been flipped around now. Uh, we both have firsthand experience. I kind of have it from you know the corporate side on, on doing study clubs and things like that. You yourself have it from lecturing yourself, but on a bigger stage with you know, DIA as well. Well, to be honest, my biggest stage yet and still is my first lecture ever. And that was in Bahrain, uh, in Manama, Bahrain, which is a little tiny country right outside of Saudi Arabia, about 20 minutes. I met someone on Instagram when we were starting Implant Compare and I lectured out there. There was like 500 Arabic speaking doctors. It was terrifying. I was trembling before, after, and the entire time of. <laughs> But it was amazing. I was on the news. I met a sheik. I went back the second year. I have a goddaughter out there. It was an amazing opportunity and, and got me into what I do now, which is, again, speaking more. I love it. Yeah, that was definitely my first one. That was a nightmare. I was terrified. In, a, in an Arabic country where you have you know Sharia law everywhere, I f- was able to find a bar and got a shot before I went on stage just to calm my nerves. <laughs> do sheiks pay well to speak? Actually, no. In the Arab countries... and. It's it's not a bad thing, or more more in the Middle East and Europe, anyways. They are used to it being treated as an opportunity to be on the stage, and they'll tell you they use the word partner, and the word partner there does not mean the word same it does here in the U.S. To me, anyways, uh, it often means that we're just collaborating, we're working together, but they will treat you very well. The best experience you'll ever have in your life uh, being hosted, I think will be going to the Middle East. But they do not pay for speakers. They expect the companies to provide the pathway. They don't like talking about money in general. It's just something that is just like distasteful to them. So they don't like that. And so if you look at the ADIC Dubai meeting, which is the largest dental conference in the world, or second largest, I think it's the largest, it is you apply to speak. Then if you're accepted and you can speak there, then you have to supply your own means there and, and your way to get there and, and your honorarium and everything. They pay you absolutely nothing. It is an opportunity to speak on their stage. And they expect your, your, your sponsor to have an exhibition as well. Is that kind of where the format for DIA came from? Because you guys don't pay your lectures, correct? No, we don't. It was the inspiration. I mean, we want to treat it as an opportunity, um, not a buy-in. And, you know, that's different. And the reason being is, one, financially, we, we were a startup. We just couldn't afford to. It wasn't – we wanted to make sure that all the funds for the event went to the experience and that we didn't have to kill people in order to have certain speakers there because there's so many out there. And so, yeah, we really disrupted that by just saying, look, if you speak on our main stage – Sorry, that's there's no fee there. But if you speak at a breakout and you want to teach something on a product or something, like let's say if you're teaching, uh, like Fine Odontics and, and Israel Putterman, right? They teach on graphing. They use a ton of products in that. And so we make it to where if you're doing a hands-on demonstration, we'll facilitate get your sponsor getting there so that they can try to, you know, be compensated for that. But yeah, it's we don't we don't pay on a rare. We just can't. We literally spend every dollar on the experience. <laughs> So it, it's it's tough doing that, and but Adic Dubai they crush. They've been doing it for a long time, uh, and and I don't think that's for everybody. I mean, look, if I want you to speak in Paducah, Kentucky, I, I've I've got to fork up some money. I'm sure you know it's not really a sp- experience I can give you out there, except for you know maybe going on a good hunt. Well, let's talk about that. You said opportunity, right? And so I've actually had the experience very recently talking to a couple of different guys. Like, what do I ask for? And here's the deal. This is how it works now. Every rep, and by the way, the reps. You know, the the nuts run the asylum out there, right? We actually have our budgets that we can pay for speakers. Unfortunately, those budgets have been cut over the years. 
for lectures, right? They're, but why? Explain why. Because a lot of people don't understand that. Uh, more than anything, ROI. The days of getting paid fifteen to twenty thousand for a lecture for a study club are, are pretty much over for unless you you're going and directly doing it yourself and collecting multiple sponsors. It, it just we have to sell so much to come up with that. So, for instance, let's say an event costs us ten thousand dollars to do. I have to turn that into forty or fifty, probably sixty thousand dollars for the company to actually make money. Now, they're smart enough to know that you're not going to necessarily make that right then and there. They're looking more for the long play, but that's a hard number to measure. And as much education that's going around now, it is so hard to pay so many different speakers, especially up and comers who want six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand. I was talking to a guy the other day. He goes, well, what do I ask for? I go, well, what's your goal? Right. Do you want to get out there and get your name out there? And that would be take less money. You know, lower your honorarium. You're never going to start out making money speaking. Nope. You're just not. You can make more in your practice. And I think a lot of people don't understand that. Well, I could make ten thousand dollars in your practice, but you're not going to get that for speaking. You know, we'll cover, you know, X amount of dollars in your travel and your hotel and stuff, but we just can't afford to pay you that much. Otherwise, I'm doing one gig a year for my territory, and that's just not going to fly for me. But if you take less money, and let's say instead of ten thousand, you take Two to three thousand. Now you can do three or four times the amount of gigs, and I'll make some phone calls for you to other reps, and, and they'll want to use you too. If you're good, everybody wins in the scenario. You're going to get a lot more gigs, and that's going to get your name out there. Now to make money long term doing that, you've really got to have your own courses that stand alone later that companies sponsor, and and that's probably the best way, in my opinion, to make money as a speaker is to have your own courses. Well, and, and to kind of dissect that a little bit, you've got to understand that as a clinician, you've got to have an ROI in your study clubs. You're putting them on so that you can get a referral base so that you can get more patients. And the same things for the company is they're supporting that study club so that they can then start seeing more cases with their system or their product. And it's the best way to get the, the product information out there. I mean, education drives this industry. That's why education budgets, you know, tend to be quite large, just like marketing budgets. But the other issue is, is you have to be a good speaker. You have to present well, you have to have a following. And now in this digital era, you have to be able to amplify your message because the rooms are so much smaller. The biggest issue right now that every company will say about conferences is that there's not as many people. They're not talking to as many people. They're still paying the same amount of money or more, but there's less people. Beforehand, the only way you could tell the story was through print media or at a, a, a conference through a lecture. So they would support lectures and that was the main funnel for them getting the message out there. But now because the conferences are diluted, the ones that hold the heart, the highest uh, success of conversion or, you know, the most power and ROI for these companies are the ones that are self-hosted courses or niche events uh, where they e either do their own party, their own conference, their own event, like Serona World. That was amazing. That's killer for them. They go all in on that. But then you go and look like a Stanley Institute or something like that. That's a great program. They're consistent. They don't go from product to product to product. They stay with their brands because that's what they believe in on the, from a scientific level. And they tell people, like, this is just what we use. We always use it and we'll always use them. And so those kind of courses hold really well. But these, you know, the, the average conference and course just doesn't have as full of a room anymore. So the KOLs have to have more currency to bring or, you know, ROI to bring in that way. And they, what they can do is have social media channels or podcasts or whatever it may be. They need to have other outlets to get the message out there. Well, and that was the part of the, why we started working together years ago. I saw Implant Compare as one of those, those pathways to expand my guys' names without having to pay them nearly as much, without them having to take time out of their clinic. So now they can do, they can get a live stream going. They can show off what they can do. They can give off some of their personality. And now their their name's getting out there more. And not just a study club that gets them, you know, 20 to 30 people to see them, but they will have, you know, we would you have almost a thousand people watching Curry on that one surgery we did? That's insane. Yeah, I mean, that was the whole idea and the premise behind it is just amplify the reach. I mean, we, you saw, I, I was... I was raised up watching Ed Mills teach the maxi course. I mean, that's, I did three of those with him and, and Leo Granados shout out to them. Uh, you know, I started there 
and that's where I learned implant dentistry and everything. And, and But the thing was, is you were still watching a screen. They had a beautiful setup upstairs in that uh, clinic. They have an operatory behind the projection screen, some see-through glass where, you know, or, but then they had a projection screen set up and they would be broadcasting that surgery and demonstrating it on that. And then they would lecture and use that same screen. And so I'm sitting there adjusting my fantasy football and I'm like, man, like we're just watching a screen still. And so I just never understood. And I think that's where our society's gotten. I mean, we're less about going to the movie and we're more about waiting for it to come out on Vudu or Netflix. I think that's where it's gone, you know? All right. I actually got a little uh, little game to play right here. So I'm actually working right now with BioHorizons to create a, a format for a DSO uh, with one of our lecturers. And we're trying to figure out, all right, with the set budget we have, how can we get the most out of this? Not just one one or two live events, but how can we get the most bang for our, our buck taking somebody who has not really uh, incorporated full arch into their practices all over the country, but starting from scratch, right? How do we get to where they feel comfortable doing it? And you're not going to do that in just one, one standalone course, right? It's not going to happen. So why don't you pl- and I play a little game right now. It might be kind of fun. What's the ideal scenario throughout, let's say, the course of 12 months? What would be the best layout for this? Well, think about it. First and foremost, you want to go and rub shoulders and get some drinks with everybody, right? So you got to have that. You got to know what you're a part of. And I think that no matter everything that's, every course I've been to, every conference, the best part about it is everybody hanging out at the bar together. You know, when you're sitting at uh, the McCormick's there, the, the, the Weston, you know, across from the exhibit hall in uh, Chicago or, you know, and you're sitting there hanging out with everybody and just enjoying the camaraderie, that's key. So I think that kicks off your meeting. you got to get everybody in person and give them the science. Man, there's not enough science out there supporting this stuff. You know, if you talk to some of these lecturers, you know, some of them are just really straight off the pamphlet. And that's not, that's not a bad thing. It's just how they've trained themselves to teach. And that's a great way to teach for certain people. And they're a great way to learn for certain people. But I think you also got to have that person who keeps it real. I think, you know, Justin Moody's good about that. Joe Marifar is good about that. You got to have someone who just keeps it honest and keeps it real. So you get them, you know, you get them exposed to some live surgery, get some, some science and biology and the terms. And then, and then you go and move it to a little bit of a blended online side and, and you mix that into a hybrid model of what we do with IC and, and hands on at home, in my opinion. Yeah. So let's say, all right, step one, two day course, maybe uh, let's throw a live surgery in there and maybe on day two, start one with the science and the why day two live surgery and maybe a, you know, a short hands on shadowing. Let them, let them be the assistant because how are you going to tell your assistant what you need if you can't even do it yourself? I think the best way you can understand the workflow and what you're going to be doing is hands in there. So I think you've got to you've got to get your hands a little dirty and assist on that case and assist on a few cases and then that gets you exposed to the procedure without actually doing it yourself. So I like that assisting, being right up in the mix with it, get, understanding a little bit of the science, and you go home. Now I would say, let's say month two or three. What about a webinar? Right? Let's do a webinar. Let's go over. We could talk about clinical concepts or like a hands-on at home. I think that would be a good point to do that where, you know, you can either place the implants or do some restorative portion of the full arch case and take another step in the clinical direction. Right there. It's a physics and, and geometry as well. You know what I mean? I mean, you look at some of these, these cases, you're like, what were they thinking? Why did they place it that way? And so before you can start planning cases like that, and you're doing, you know, anatomical function, when you're doing a full mouth reconstruction, it's a lot different when you're trying to get that occlusion, it's a drastic change. So I think you need to go to the basics and understand how that occlusion is going to bite and what that's going to look like, what your vertical clearance needs to be, et cetera. Yeah, that's a good point. Understanding the why of the clinical part, right? Why am I angulating implant over the nerve? Why am I using a short implant here? Why do I need a good AP spread? All those different things. Yeah, you have to understand the why there. Otherwise, you're going to come back to massive failures later. Why do I need 14 to 15 millimeters of intraural space? Otherwise, I, I'm going to have fractures of my appliance over and over as well. So no, the key concepts for sure clinically. Let's say the third one, probably live surgery again. So now that you've taken some of this in, but do like a live stream implant compare doing another case because 
the second time you see something, you go, oh, that's why he did that because now I understand some of the concepts for it. Yeah, no, I agree. I think you I think you get them exposed to a few cases, maybe a, a few days that you open up and say, we're going to cut the cameras on and, and, and blast out some surgeries. Because I think you, it's just it's repetition. And it's like fighting. You're like, man, I got a lot of fights back in college. I got kicked out of every single bar and one of them three times. And usually it was thrown out by multiple people. <laughs> I'm this tiny little, you know, 145 pound soaking wet, you know, Irishman, but I, I, I always love to scrap. And and I think you got to learn how to fight and fight through it. And, um, damn dude, I got sidetracked on that one. Yeah. What the hell was that? It takes multiple people to throw your ass out. Come on now. Not if you hit you over the head with a bottle and knock your ass out. That'd be easy. No, <laughs> no. Um, it, no, it, seriously, I got in a fight with the, the strongman winner, uh, at Georgia Southern. Uh, he was being racist though. I mean, he was like picking on my buddy and uh, what I went to high school with. And yeah, I ended up jumping into a fight with him and it, just to kind of defend them, my buddy and long story short, I got thrown out by three bouncers. I was airborne. It was awesome. <laughs> very honorable, but very stupid, but no, we'll edit this out. But like, what, where, where, what do you, where did I, where was I going with that? I'm sorry. I got distracted. Bullshit. I'm leaving all this in. Um, but no, we, we talk about, all right. So step one is in-person course. I like that. Cause you want to get bill camaraderie. The people. Oh, we're talking about reps. So anyways, the more I fought, the more I, the better I was at fighting. I was more defensive, you know? And so my big belief is that like the, it's just like fighting, just like doing sutures or extracting teeth. The more reps you get, the better you're at, you are at it. And that's what residency really is, is exposure more than anything. So you've got to get exposed to more. You just don't know. Stuff goes wrong, man. Like it gets, it gets hairy. Like what we were talking to, I won't name the doctor, but we were talking to someone the other day and he was like, man, I fucked up on this case. It was not good. You know, fracture the palate and, 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 you know, that stuff happens. You need to know what to do because you can't just like throw your instruments down and cry and run to a corner. So you've got to see how a Justin Moody or a Bart Silverman or somebody like that navigates their way through a problem. Like Nader Salib, great one. You know, oh man, we've got an issue here. What are we going to do? So I think that's what the aspect of, you know, being able to watch other surgeons in the quantity is beneficial. Yeah. Repetition, repetition. Because every time you go into a full arch case, I think I've been in a thousand now. Today was an interesting case. It was a lower, right? And, you know, left side of the mandible, we had uh, the first implant in the posterior torque in at 80 Newton centimeters. Like that's torque. Man. The second one was 80 as well, right? On the anterior side. Then we go to the other, the right side, um, anterior 35, still great. Then we go to the posterior portion. And in mandible, you expect to have really good stability, really good bone. And I swear it was a cortical plate on the lingual cortical plate on the buckle and nothing in between. It was crazy, dude. It wasn't even porous. It was just non-existent. I, I had never seen it to that point, And I've been in that many cases. You really do, to your point, have to see over and over and over because there will be something thrown at you every single time. And it's the only way to truly learn more is through either your mistakes, other people's mistakes, or just watching over and over. So I really do like that point of seeing more and more and more. That's why I, I like to be involved with so many surgeries because I sound really smart when other smart people figure out how to do, get around a problem. And then I see it again in another case. And I tell this doctor who's never seen that problem before how to do it. Uh, it's just a matter of reps. Well, like we were talking about today, Shark Tank, right? And you and I enjoy watching that show. That's, that's relatable. It's watching our counterparts do their thing over and over again. You love watching sales movies, right? You love you love seeing what you do in action through someone else. That's relatable, and so I think that's where the live surgery and Instagram and all the stuff is just helping everybody out, man. Because you just get exposed to more scenarios, more situations, and you're being able to make yourself more adaptable to those situations. Not for sure. You know, if you see if you see you have something uh, some kind of issue, you're like, oh man, what the hell? You know, then you can all say, oh, I remember this one case I saw. You know, oh, they did this perfect. You know what I mean? That was where it comes into play. No, exactly. All right. So we've got the, the first session is in person. The second session is like a webinar style. Third is a live stream surgery. I think another webinar after that one, right? So we're, we're getting past halfway through the year, another webinar, maybe talking about how do we talk to patients and the emotional side of this, because that's a huge part of it is the actual emotional side and actually communicating with patients and getting your team involved with that too. Because people don't do this to have screws in their mouth. They don't do it to have you rip their teeth out. That's all terrifying. They do it because not even because they want teeth, they want 
those teeth for a certain reason. I want to look younger. I want to feel better. I want to date again. I want to eat a, you know, a medium rare steak and I want some corn on the cob. They're thinking of that specific food. That's why people are doing it. So I think that would be a, a, a really good webinar is talk about the why on the emotional side, not the clinical side. Yeah. I wonder how many clinicians that do full arts show a video on an iPad to their patients of testimonials from their past patients. Like the, like when they get their final prosthesis and they do that interview and they're smiling and they're crying and all that stuff. Like, I wonder if anybody shows that off. They should, they should show it off before they get there. I think what, you know, I never really thought about this before, but to have like a video of multiple patients, what I would do is if there's a patient similar to them, either has, you know, similar background or similar problem or similar profile, whatever, send them that video after their consultation say, Hey, we thought you might, we really enjoyed having you here. This is a big decision for you to make, but we wanted to share this with you because, you know, Sally was a similar scenario to you. And that really gives them, that's a great follow-up and a very valuable one to the patient too. No, I think that would be good. And, you know, a lot of people listening are probably like, all right, well, th- this, this is just a plug for Implant Compare. I think there's a lot of great platforms for webinars out there. You can use those as well. But you think, I think you should use, leverage the technology, say, because if you're, we're talking about honorariums going down because of lower budgets and compliance issues and everything else, then that means they, if they don't have to cover your hotel and flight, your business class flight, they have a little bit more money to spend. And they're not taking you to this $1,500 dinner either. And you get to just do it from home or your clinic. And so that's why I still am such a big believer on leveraging online. Because one, as an attendee, it costs a lot of money just to shut down your clinic and go fly into a four-day course Thursday through Sunday and be there all day away from family and still try to run your business and everything else. You know, it's just a nightmare. And, and same thing for the, the speaker. It's, it's just a loss leader. So I think that's why you leverage online is in this blended way because then it saves the company money and they'll expect less of an ROI and they're able to, again, have a little bit more funds there for supporting you and your organization or your institute or whatever that may be. No, I, I really, I like that point because like so far we've got four different programs right here. Uh, three of which are actually digitally done. They could be done after hours or in clinic time while you're actually doing the surgery. As a speaker, you wouldn't need as much money because you're not you're not out of your practice at all. You're not losing any money there. You're taking some time to prep for the course and everything and, and maybe an hour or two after office hours are closed. But this allows you to affect and teach more people without having to request as much money, which is better for the companies, which means you're getting more gigs, getting more exposure out there for you as the speaker but it works really well for the company and the the people paying as well. And it won't cost them as much either. That's where this is all going. Now, I think the next one is probably, let's bring them back one more time to do the live surgery and hands-on themselves, not just assisting, right? So bring it back one more time. I think that would be the deal. No, I agree. I, I love what Marin Farr and Moody and uh, those guys are doing with their programs because – You've got to get involved and you got to do live patient. But man, I'm telling you, going down to Mexico and just placing implants and never seeing that patient again, that's not how you learn how to do this. You've got to see the final prosthesis. You know, Nader Salib and Knife Sonata, they were going to do a course and, you know, uh, it's called Biologically Driven. And the way they were doing it is a surgical pros and a, a surgeon they would take both their perspective and go from pros down and uh, implants up and meet in the middle on this collaboration on this case. And you've got to understand what the final product looks like in order to know how to really effectively do these uh, implants. And so that's why I think that you've got to do something like that where you're able to see the patient from A to Z. And so, you know, Moody and Marifar, man, they they both have some great, great programs so that you can actually do that. You just reminded me what we should do. The patient from the first one who we did the live surgery on is back for the last one. So you get to do the surgery live, but you also get to do the final restore, see the final restorative portion for that patient. You're smarter than you look, Blake. <laughs> I am not, and I don't think I look that smart. So that's scary. Uh, I, I just, you know, I think you see it a lot, and you get exposed to the good, bad, and otherwise. And warts and all, it's a really good process. It's a great procedure. Patients really benefit, and you can do it really well without disrupting your practice or, you know, losing money doing it, which a lot of people do. They get into it and they're in over their head and it stops them from doing anything else because they shut the practice down just for one arch and 
then it ends up being a complication and they have to go back and fix things. It, it, it's a nightmare. So I think you got to see it all the way through, see all the workflows because everyone has their own cocktail. It's just like bone grafting. You have your own recipe. And if you want to use a Chrome guide in this lab and then, you know, or maybe you want to do a, just a pilot guide and then freehand the rest. And then you want to digitally mail your own prosthesis. There's just so many ways you can do it. You know, you've got to go see a playground and play with all the toys and then go, okay, this is the way that is best for me. No, I completely agree. And I think after the fact there, I think what's coming, we both know, is is kind of this one-on-one mentorship because of technology now with video and live stream. You can have a mentor, you know, one hour a week or a month, look over your shoulder on a case or, or review a case with you too. And I think for the guys who really want to dive into this and and feel like they have not necessarily a safety net, but somebody, a mentor, obviously, to go back to and, and discuss these with and what did I do here and what should I do here and help me plan this case. I think that's the ideal way to do it because you don't want to, I, I get it all the time. Will you help me plan this case? And, you know, in my younger days, I would have said yes until I really started thinking about it. If you need me to help you plan the case, you need to go to another course. You don't want to lean on your rep for that portion of it to use the product. Yeah, but not necessarily to fully plan the case. Right. That's that's a problem. Well, that's the other thing. It's a can of worms. You know, how much do you want to do? I'm a big fan of outsourcing the planning. Uh, if you can leverage that, if you have a good relationship with a company and you feel like you trust them to you know plan your cases and you kind of just give an initial plan to go on and then they finish it out for you. I think that's the best way. I mean, even if you print in house and mill in house, that'll save you some money. But you going into the planning side of things and trying to take over the lab side and everything else, it, it's really a lot more than people realize. And it's, it's a full-time job to learn it. You know, we were talking to a guy the other day, he's been doing 3d engineering for years and he's like, man, you know, planning a case like that, you know, to get to that skill set takes a, several years of learning. And so to try to figure out how to do digital 3d workflow, you know, as a side hobby, you've got to decide if that's in your band, you know, attainable with your allocated bandwidth. You got to decide, you know, what you can really do because it's going to take a lot of learning to understand ExoCAD and all that stuff. Yeah, I think it's important to understand the concepts and, uh, again, the why behind the clinical portion. But yeah, if somebody's done, you know, 5,000 arches and planned them and you have the same mindset as them and understand, like, like they're planning. I mean, that's more efficient anyways. And you could say, well, let's change this here. Let's change this here. But that'll save you a lot of time. I know Jim Howell does that on some of his guided cases with guided surgical solutions where they basically plan it. And then he goes, well, change this, change that. Perfect right there. So it's his plan in the end, but he's skipping through a lot of the BS of having to learn every in and out of each individual software and all that. True. And Sadie's probably planned more orthopedic cases than most surgeons by 10x. So you know, you're in good hands with that one. <laughs> oh, absolutely, man. I think that's where you leverage people's specialties, but still have a high level view of everything. Well, I appreciate your help there. You just helped me do all my homework. So you saved me a couple hours of doing it by myself. So no, I mean, of course I'm biased, but I mean, I'm also like trying to disrupt this whole model for, for a reason. And I think that Again, we just wanted to be a platform like YouTube. So if if I told people I was YouTube, I was going around saying, you know, you should be putting your stuff on YouTube, it wouldn't be as, I think, defensive. You know, because like I told you, we had a lot of organizations that just wouldn't work with us, even though we offered to do it for free. We're just out there trying to explain the technology. I, I think you, it, no matter if you do a webinar with Implant Compare, and to be honest, I hate doing webinars. They're the most difficult thing to do. So if you want to do a webinar with another platform, I wouldn't be angry at you. But if you're doing live surgery, you can work with us, man. We, we do it well. You guys, why is is a webinar sometimes more difficult than live surgery? Because it's commoditized. Um, and so there's just so many different ones out there. And they always have an integration issue. And they may not be up to date. And when you're pushing it to a separate platform, you have to use one software to push it to our platform. And so it just... And, and, and more, more importantly, it's usually the technology on the presenter's side. People think they have really good internet and they have really good computers until they realize that they don't. And so quite often, you know, and it's not to their fault. I mean, ha half the time they've been sold this technology by a company. And then we're like, hey, yeah, we're having issues here. Let's check out what you really have under the hood. And it's like, an, you know, five-year-old chip or processor. And, you know, today's graphics and video is just, it requires a lot. You buy a new TV every few years, pretty much, you know, or a gaming system or anything else. Why wouldn't you buy a computer every few years? 
I, I've heard our industry has been known to be cheap sometimes, including myself, by the way, because I bought a new computer recently and I said, oh, I want to be able to live stream and use the software if I need to and, or whatever. And I, I called you and asked you, I was like, all right, what do I need? And you told me the specs I needed. I started looking at the price. And I'm like, you know what? I, I'm going to hold off. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, dude, how many people have an iPhone 11 or XS or 10? You know, those things are like two grand and you buy, I mean, Apple makes it to where you have to buy a new one every two years. So, you know, they, with this, once the new software update comes out, start slowing your phone down just in time for their new release. And so, but your computer, it's your lifeblood. I don't know. I, I buy one every two years pretty much. And, but I buy them refurbished from MacBook, or, um, Macintosh, whatever. You can buy um, the, there's a, it's, I think it's called Mac Refurb or something like that. It's a, it's part of the Apple program and they're much cheaper. I mean, and they're certified refurbished. You get a warranty and everything. Mine just fall apart because I drop them and I forget them somewhere. I think I lost the last one on a plane. Yeah. Well, you know, we were talking too about the the KOLs and, you know, honorarians of the company. You know, one thing I learned in the past, I guess, 30 days or so was there's a matrix that these companies use based on your publications and your social media channels and things like that that calculates for them what your ROI should be. I don't know to be talking about this. This is a big time industry secret right here. Yes. And this is from actually a medical company. Uh, it's not even a dental company. Um, they you they have like this, you know, equation that they basically give points and metrics and a score to each KOL and decide what they pay them. And so because they have to, because of compliance breathing down their neck, and, and dentistry doesn't really have this as much. We have some companies that are medical and dental. So they overlap in that gray area. And so they're held to a much stricter compliance than the dental companies. But it, it's really a, it's a issue for them because they'd love to pay you a, a lot, you know, but then the, the board members are going, well, look, this isn't, again, this isn't showing the ROI we used to see. And then you've got the uh, Justice Department breathing down their neck, just waiting for them to slip up. And you've got this ambiguous sunshine act you know anti-kickback stuff that's going on that part of it's being implemented but no one's really doing any follow-up on it they're being very selective on who they attack and investigate on sunshine stuff so it's just really gray area for all these companies and no one has a straight direction so they try to use these self-produced matrices to decide what they're was I going to pay someone? Yeah. Speaking on that, I used to be back in the day when I first started dental, I used to be able to pay for Doc's golf. And so I got to be on the golf course all the time. My handicap was really low. And then the sunshine guy comes in. Yeah, it happened. No, seriously. You know, I, it's, I mean, I think that it got out of hand in the drug world. A hundred percent. And it really got out of hand in orthopedics too, I think. And that's where a lot of companies got in trouble. And to be honest, it started a long time ago, but it kept going on. And I think a doctor should be compensated for their time 100%. You know, I, I, I don't disagree with that. A big medical company, and I won't say which one, who bought a doctor a pool and put their logo on it to justify it. And that, uh, that kind of screwed all of us here. So, wow. No, I mean, it, look, it, it, it changed things. I mean, it, the Sunshine Act really hit everybody pretty hard. And at the, the end of the day, it's what, the way the system was set up, and it now it's completely changed. What do we do? Yeah, for sure. Well, we don't have too much more time, so let's kind of bring this back to what we were talking before, before I pulled us off the topic. Um, so for, for a guy coming in saying they want to be an educator, where would you start? All right. If you want to start speaking, you, again, it's going to go back to working with a rep, your local rep that you trust and you respect and that you think is out there pounding the pavement because I'm telling you, it is really hard to fill butts and seats. It's one of the hardest things to do about these courses to put button seat, put these butts and seats. And so first and foremost, start developing a relationship with a local rep with a product that you really believe in. Then you need to start crafting up a study club and then offering to speak at other study clubs locally because you need to get your reps in. You got to practice. You got to fall. You got to stumble. You got to make some shitty slides. And you got to do some, you know, uh, some choke up moments. And you got to have the mic not work and get through those bumps and hurdles so that when, when you're put on stage at, you know, Greater New York or AAID main stage, 
you're ready and you're sharp because that's the difference between Tony Robbins and me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you're right. You need to do the first few locally, do them cheap or free. And I mean that because I'll promise you this, your 20th lecture is going to be a lot better than your first and second one because you'll just learn from it. And you'll you, if you pay attention to what people like and you should be able to see when you're if they're nodding off on their phones or not paying attention, right? You should be able to get that feedback and ask for real, you know, criticism from the rep and allow them to tell you what's up because don't just do it and ask for, cause you want to hear that you're great. You need to hear where you need to improve and you've got to have an ego check there. 100%. Yeah, you do. And you need to know how to relate to people. I mean, you're going to get up there and you're going to need to break the ice with something. You know, I still struggle with that in the beginning. Your intro will probably always change. You know, there's nothing really different about being a, a speaker in dentistry and being a comedian. They're very tough. I mean, you're going to speak in front of thousands of people at some point. So, and, and the same thing with social media, you're, you may have 10, 20, 100,000 followers. It's a lot of people that are seeing you every day. So the more you get comfortable with like being in front of that presence or, you know, performing, if you will, and you get more comfortable just being yourself and you're comfortable in your own skin, the better your presentations will come off. It's less about the slides and more about you. And so that's, I mean, that's what was great about social media. It, it gives you the opportunity to get those reps in without having to waste it on a big uh, conference or study club or something like that. You know, lever, get behind that camera, turn it on, you know, feel awkward, get out of your comfort zone, and then you'll own that stage. Because I mean, I'm going to tell you, There'll be crowds that won't be paying attention. They'll be on their phones. You'll be seeing a bunch of heads, not eyes. And it's going to it's gonna screw with your head. And in, even as a, especially with like reps and stuff, I mean, I trembled when I had to talk in front of a sedation course of eight people. My business partner still brings it up. He always makes fun of me about it, Rod. He's like, yeah, remember when you trembled all the time and just to do a sedation course? I mean, I, I couldn't talk about an AED without like shaking. I was terrified. And it was eight people in a little small room. So I think you you just get comfortable in your skin and you'll own it you'll own the stage you'll own the webinar you'll own the live surgery whatever it is yeah i actually have three three things that i think helps everybody number one if you're going to speak speak on something you know inside and out if you talk on something you don't know if you get thrown off at some point you're screwed it's so hard to jump back into it because you don't know every angle of it if you're fully comfortable with something and you really understand what you're talking about doesn't mean it has to be something complex but you need to understand it then you can be drawn off in another area and jump right back into it because it's what you deal with every day. So I say that's number one. Number two is a funny joke, right? If you can get somebody to like you at the beginning, maybe you're not funny, right? But if there's a lot of funny clips of videos out there, right? Uh, Bart Silverman, he's funny anyways, but he always, he'll tell a joke and he plays a funny little clip from a video, usually like Anchorman or something like that. You've already broken the ice by making them laugh and now they inherently like you more and people want to engage with people they like. And then the third one is this, and this is what I tell everybody I do a course with now. If you're smart, and Dr. Shish Patel actually did a landing page for this. If you could reach out to the attendees ahead of time, and it's not always easy to do, but ask them, what do you want to get out of this? I've had somebody who didn't like a course. It was on uh, like restoring an immediate implant or something like that. And he wanted it to be on CBCT planning, nothing to do with what we were talking about for that particular one. And, but he was upset because that's what he wanted to get out of it, which makes no sense logically, but he was upset about that. Now, if you had known that ahead of time, you could have thrown something in there and, and now you've hit everything that they want and you know ahead of time what to put in your presentation too that may have not been inherent to you at the beginning. So that's three easy tips right there off the bat that will help you get going in the right direction. No, I agree. Those are great tips. Those are really great tips. It's a time that where you can own your own brand and do it in a classy, tasteful way. I think in the past in dentistry, we've seen some people kind of really be cheesy, I guess, with it. And that I think intimidates a lot of people or terrifies them in a sense. They don't want to become that. And just because you're promoting yourself and you're out there speaking, you can do it in a way that doesn't come off as you're trying to put your name on every single thing from the pins and shirts and you know hats and everything. You don't have to make it like this fan club. You can still be out there speaking and just be a great clinician and an influencer in the dental community, especially even as a rep or, or a business executive 
you know, it's not just clinician. I mean, I can know a ton of great speakers that are reps out there. I mean, hell, I, I, I'm speaking somehow, you know, people are paying me to go on stage, but <laughs> and there's a lot of really talented speakers out there. Yeah, actually, I'm doing a gig next week and I'm not talking about implants. I'm talking about social media marketing. And guess where I learned all my stuff from? Some asshole that I'm talking to right now. <laughs> I just share the message, man. That's all. I think it, I think it's funny every time I go and, you know, I'm lecturing. I'm like, man, I can't believe this. I'm going to give a lecture in New York, whatever. And it feels really good. I mean, it sucks to have the time away from the home. I know that that you have to find a balance, you know, but it's still very rewarding. There's nothing more gratifying than, you know, talking to a whole room of very intelligent people and educating them. It's a very rewarding feeling. And I think it's something that helps you evade the burnout because it keeps it constantly evolving and changing. Now, let me ask you this. Why on earth would somebody want to ask you to speak? And I'm not actually like being a jerk about this. What was the topic you were speaking on at most of your lectures? Most of them were social media or v video or branding. Uh, talking about branding, a lot of it's all comes back to the social media stuff. I mean, it really all started because we started an Instagram a few years ago, about four years ago now, I guess. Because you had a topic they were interested in and you're an expert on, right? So what would you say, you know, we usually do at the end of each episode, we usually do something about like a sales tip or something like that. But let's do this. What topic would you say is probably the most in demand right now that there's really no supply of right now? What would you say? This is a freebie for anybody who wants to start lecturing and put something together because the topic itself is very, very important here. You don't want to do the same thing as everybody else. So what, what, Blake, what would you say is a topic that's in high demand? If you're an oral surgeon that's willing to teach how to yank whizzies, you'll be bankrolling. There's a million people out there who want to learn how to yank whizzies. I never even thought about that one. Yep. No one's teaching it. Live surgery course, yank and whizzies. And that you can't go down to Mexico and do because you don't need to do any follow-up. <laughs> Just shuck some thirds and come home. And people want to learn that. So mine is actually this, and I'm working with somebody, Dr. Skylar Holcomb right now. He's like, well, I want to do a topic that's uh, really engaging and interesting. And I go, you know what it is that nobody's doing right now? How to take a simple impression, how to take it, why would I take an open tray? Why would I do a custom uh, impression tray? Why would I uh, scan here? The absolute basics. I feel like everybody right now has skipped from A all the way to J that goes into let's place an implant, but they don't learn the restorative part or the basics. And I can't tell you how many times I get people asking me this, hey, do you have a course I could go to on restoring an Im just res restorative portion at a beginner level? There's just none out there right now. No, you're right. I, I think that's a great course. I mean, and, and one you need to bring the team in on. Team-involved courses need to be uh, more frequent. There's a lot of people looking for that, especially when you go into surgery and your assistant's now a surgical assistant. You need to educate the team on what that looks like. I mean, I don't know why with these sedation courses, they don't bring in the assistant for a mini residency as well. Because she or he is vital to that position. That is the second most important, or may, I would honestly say the most important person in that room because they're going to be the one looking for the items, handing them to the clinician, and honestly keeping them on track because your mind's going a million miles an hour if you have an, an episode. So I, I think that there needs to be way more uh, team-involved courses that uh, do the workflow and product and things like that. Yeah, more certifications for assistants and and. and employees in general it makes them more valuable um and it makes them more ingrained in the practice they feel ownership of it. it's like taking a marketing course as a dentist but not bringing whoever your marketing person is internal to it it makes no sense at all yeah that's a really good point man yeah i mean my wife she goes to teacher conferences all the time i mean it's part you know my buddy's a lawyer he goes to conferences all the time too to ce i mean you gotta have you got to have this stuff. So I think it's okay. And it gives them some, owner, like you said, some ownership in the practice. They feel like they're part of something. You're, you're investing in them and their education. Well, cool, man. No, I really enjoyed this one because we talk about this stuff all the time and we, we talk offline with doctors about this all the time, but I think it's really valuable and really important. And maybe we should do like a, a follow-up one later, see if anybody's taking advantage of some of these topics. Man, if I see a whizzy tooth, uh, wisdom tooth removal course out there. I think that's going to be legit. You need to get some sort of royalty on that, man. 
<laughs> I've been trying to convince Butch Ferguson to do it forever. He uh, he's still teaching there at Augusta. He loves to teach, but uh, you know he's he's com- married to that school down there. So, but yeah, I think it'd be a great program. And maybe maybe next time we'll talk about the Shug Knight of dentistry and the guy that's managing all the KOLs. I thought that was you. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to give him a vehicle, man. I don't want to manage any KOL. That's a nightmare. Man, that would be actually an interesting episode. Well, what do you got? Uh, today's Thursday. So uh, what do you got tomorrow and this weekend, man? Do you have some crazy place again? No travel, man. It's been the best two weeks of my life. Uh, I haven't traveled so, uh, these past two weeks. So I got AEID next week, and then it's all crazy again for a little while. But uh, this weekend, Lace and I are going to go check out the uh, Atlanta United playoff game, round one, baby. We're going to win that. And then we're going to a concert uh, that night. So a little twofer. How about you? Well, I've got a very important day tomorrow. I got to get up early and uh, there's an orthodontist in town in Mahaffey. He's got a a charity golf tournament that I'm prepping for and playing in. So I got invited to play by my buddy, Dr. Chuck Barber, who's a restorative dentist and a neighbor. And I'm playing the other guy. One of the other guys on his team is uh, Casey over there at Nobel, man. So I'm our A player, which means we are absolutely screwed. Uh, but we were born with swine flu, by the way. Let's make a note of that. His his nickname or his screen name on Instagram, born with swine flu. Big Arkansas fan. Dude, Casey's awesome. So just so you guys know, all right, we are going to do an episode with him. We have to. Uh, he is actually my direct competitor. He is one of the funniest dudes you'll ever meet. Uh, we're actually really good friends. We, our wives and all of us have gone out to dinner. Like he and I hang out on a regular basis because he's just an awesome dude. But he was used to be a preacher. He was an auctioneer. He just has this, he managed one of the biggest labs in the country. He's just, and he's a killer implant rep, which is really frankly kind of annoying to me, but uh, he is one of the most entertaining guys in dental. So we'll have to get him on here soon. (laughs) Yeah. I like him. I think I worked with him on a Curry case or something like that. I think he showed up for one of those. What was Curry cheating on me? Or is this before we got together? I don't like to talk about it. No, I think, I think it was the case that you were there. I think it was the one that – was it the pal top case? It was. He was cheating on both of us. That's what it was. He was. Weird. Well, to be fair, it was for free. We did a free case for a very nice person in need. I'll, he gets a pass. Just one, though. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> well, man, enjoy your your last weekend, probably through the end of the year, where you're not having to do too much, man. And I will uh, go shoot a million at this golf tournament. Man, get out of here. You're a scratch golfer. Enjoy it, brother. All right, guys. We'll catch you on the next episode of the All In Podcast. Thanks for listening to the All In Podcast. See you next time.